Hi, welcome back to the second half of History 3375, Session 10. In the first half, we looked at the historical background of Chile, and the crisis that we described was one in which over more than a half a century's time, as Chilean society tried to expand uh, access to resources and to political power to various groups, that a crisis point was reached in the 1960s and especially in the 1970s when the peasantry uh, was to be incorporated into society more fully, uh, especially in terms of a radical land redistribution policy and also the policies of the Allende government aimed towards redistributing income towards the lower half of the population, not only peasants but the working class as well, that this final effort to expand access to opportunities and resources uh, caused the system to break down into a violent conflict, uh, essentially dividing the society in a half. And we saw the outcome of that in the military coup that toppled Allende on September 11th, 1973. Now that story, as I said in the first half, tells the actual events of Chile's domestic history uh, over the course of about a century. But those events as I described them, especially in the 1960s and 70s, leaves out a very important part of the story, and that is the role of the United States, and particularly the Central Intelligence Agency in these events, especially events transpiring between 1970 and 73. And those are the events and those are the activities that we're going to look at now. If we go to the first slide, you'll see that Chile and the United States had a fairly long relationship, but not of the order of Chile, or I mean the United States and Cuba. Uh, the United States was not as intensively involved in Chile, which plays on the far western side of South America, as it was, of course, in the more proximate uh, location of Cuba. Nevertheless, as we did see, the United States, particularly after 1900, developed important economic interests in Chile, first investments in copper and then in nitrates. So there is this ongoing and fairly important economic relationship that evolves in the, second or the first half of the 20th century. But beyond that, Chile took on another significance for this country besides these economic investments. And that had to do with political, ideological, and you might even say strategic considerations. And it has to do specifically with the growing American concern after World War II about the possible influence of communism in Latin America. Latin America, of course, was vitally important to the United States. It's closely proximate. We share the same hemisphere. Uh, many of these regions are important economically to the United States in terms of large investments. And with the increasing intensity of the Cold War of the 1950s, the United States became concerned that communism might well spread to third world countries. And we saw this especially uh, when we were looking at the Congo. We realized the change in policy from the Soviet Union once Nikita Khrushchev comes into power in the mid-1950s with his greater concern with third world areas. And certainly Latin America would be a prime possibility, at least, for the Soviets. Then, with the successful revolution of Fidel Castro in Cuba in January of 1959, the United States became convinced that, indeed, the Soviet Union was making a major effort, that Castro's revolution was really a product of Soviet influence, and now, of course, a close ally uh, had been created for the Soviet Union in Cuba, closely proximate to the United States, and of course, the unfolding events of the Bay of Pigs and then the missile crisis convinced American policymakers that they faced a serious challenge, particularly from leftist insurgencies, leftist political movements in Latin America during the 1960s and 70s. And the United States became almost obsessed with the idea of how to counter the influence of Fidel Castro on the Soviets. 
truth is the Soviets were making very little effort in Latin America because they knew that the United States, of course, would become very upset and they'd have great difficulties with the U.S. if they challenged it there. Uh, they were certainly willing to back Castro, but they weren't really putting any resources into promoting uh, other leftist movements in Latin America. But that was not the perception of the United States. And so the United States is looking for ways to counter what they think is growing Soviet, but especially Cuban, influence in Latin America. And their search for ways of providing an alternative model, an alternative to the uh, socialism that Castro was pursuing in Cuba, come to settle on Chile. <laughs> Chile seemed like an ideal candidate to serve as a showcase of what U.S. influence could accomplish in Latin America, an alternative to the sort of worker's paradise that communism promised. The Americans wanted to show that, well, third world countries can pursue capitalist development. They can enjoy uh, political participation in a liberal democracy. and they can solve their problems of acute underdevelopment and especially extreme distributions of wealth that leave so much of the population in poverty. All those problems can be solved using an American model, modeling them themselves on us. And Chile seemed to be the place where that experiment might work. It could be a showcase. Why? Well, the country had a long history of elected government. Now, admittedly, uh, the political system was not very democratic in the 19th century. Very few people could vote, essentially the elite. But the country had a long history, only occasionally interrupted, of constitutional government. The franchise had gradually been expanded to organize labor in the middle class. Uh, peasants were coming into the process, although their votes were controlled by the elite initially. But certainly by the 1960s and certainly by the 1970 election, uh, they are voting pretty much as they choose. So here is a long history of constitutional government and growing access to the political franchise. Chile has economic problems, certainly. It has a large unemployed population. 20% or more of the population is of the economically active population is unemployed. Uh, there are problems with distributions of wealth. There are problems of getting the economy moving in a steady and positive rate of growth. But still, compared to the acute problems in other countries, um, perhaps Bolivia, Haiti, some of the Central American republics, Chile's problems seemed highly solvable to the Americans. It wouldn't take that much tinkering with the agrarian system, with the process of industrialization, to get this country really moving ahead effectively. And it already has a long history of positive political developments in terms of constitutional government and elections. Chile became one of the principal recipients of assistance under the program begun by President Kennedy in 1961 called the Alliance for Progress. Essentially, the Alliance for Progress was going to provide, over the course of a decade, $20 billion in aid to Latin American countries to promote things like land reform, expanded and improved education, improved health systems, housing. At the same time, those resources would be parceled out to those countries that demonstrated a commitment to reform. In other words, you have to be carrying out land reform. Otherwise, we're not going to provide assistance to agriculture. You have to show that you are expanding opportunities in education for much of the population that doesn't have access to education. And we will then help you build classrooms or whatever. So it would be a carrot and stick approach, if you will. If you, as long as you are pursuing reform, we'll help you finance it. We'll provide the money to help promote these ideas. So we'll get economic development, we'll get improved social conditions, and hopefully we'll get more participatory democracy out of this process. On a per capita basis, 
Chile would be the largest recipient of Alliance for Progress monies, in other words, per head. It would be the leading recipient of Alliance for Progress monies because it was seen as this showcase. You know, here's a place where we could make a very big difference in a short time because conditions seem ripe for this country to achieve real development and solve some of its problems. And with the 1964 election, this seemed especially true because the Christian Democrats under Frey were talking the same kind of language as American policymakers in the Alliance for Progress. They too wanted reform, although, and both sides agree, it has to be moderate reform. We don't want a radical change to take place. We agreed that the government needs to f funnel more money into education, to begin land reform. So they're talking the same kind of language as the Alliance for Progress people. And they seem the ideal candidates to carry out this change, this move towards economic development, this move towards a better distribution of wealth in society. So the United States puts a good deal of its resources in the Alliance for Progress at the disposal of the Christian Democrats and Eduardo Frey to help make their efforts a success. Of course, along the way, there's also political consideration, and that is that money poured into the Frey administration and used by them is going to improve the electoral chances of the Christian Democrats in the long run, because people say, well, you know, Christian Democrats come in and suddenly, you know, there's billions of dollars available in foreign aid, and we get new programs, new schools, etc. We'll vote for the Christian Democrats again. So more than just idealistic concerns about development, there's also the concern that this will help the Christian Democrats stay in power. The other major connection, of course, between the United States and Chile, besides the idea that Chile would be the showcase that would demonstrate to the rest of Latin America that it could pursue a course of uh, development that reflected, that mimicked the United States. Aside from that concern, there was the fact that by 1970, the U.S. has a billion dollars invested in Chile. Private business has taken on large investments, the largest, of course, being copper. The value of U.S. copper investments is somewhere around $350 million at this time. So this is a big chunk of change. So there's this larger concern about demonstrating that a third world country can pursue a model of development that is compatible with U.S. interests and opposed to communism. But there's also the practical interest that we get a billion dollars tied up there. We don't want to see it disappear. Now, the CIA had long paid attention to Chile as well. Even before the Alliance for Progress, the CIA was very sensitive, as was the U.S. government, to the idea that this is a representative democracy, still flawed. Its franchise isn't certainly completely democratic as of the early 1950s, but still, compared to many Latin American countries where elections are rarely held and often rigged, here was a country that seemed to be moving in the right direction and progressively getting better in terms of its electoral practices. The last thing in the world we want to see happen is to have a leftist elected by these people. To see a socialist like Salvador Allende be elected by people in a Latin American country because one of the basic premises of the Cold War is that people don't willingly choose socialism or communism. It's imposed upon them by violent revolution. So if Chileans of their own free will choose the socialist who's backed by communists uh, to be their president, then that whole argument to people about communism and how it comes to power will go up the tubes. And more and more people may well convince themselves that this is the road that they should pursue. So we need to prevent that from happening. We can't let a democratic election in Chile produce a socialist slash communist government. And therefore, the CIA involved itself intimately in Chile's elections all the way back as early as 1958, because Allende was running for president in 1958. And in 1964 when he ran again. Now in 1958, the basic 
political configuration is the same as a, I described in the first half. You've got a center, a left, and a right. And basically, each segment is going to pick up about a third of the vote. So a relatively few votes can make the difference in who gets elected, because nobody's going to get 51%. You know, center, left, and right will each get about a third of the vote, so it's really a percentage point here or there uh, will determine who becomes the next president. Now, in 1958, the CIA is very concerned that Allende will, in fact, win the election. And therefore, it puts money into opposition candidates' campaigns to help try to defeat him. Along the way, a very interesting phenomena develops. Aside from the expected candidates representing the major parties, a defract Catholic priest decides that he's going to run for president. He has worked in the slums of the major cities of Chile, one of the major places where Allende gets his votes. Although he has no apparent resources, he's able to run a national campaign. He wins just over 55,000 votes. Allende misses finishing first by about 50,000 votes. The CIA had helped back the priest's campaign, knowing that more than any other candidate, this one would draw votes away from Allende. People that were likely to vote for Allende would be the same people who might vote for the defract priest. So they cleverly managed to focus resources to help divert enough votes to keep Allende out of office. With 1964, they were once again faced with this dilemma. How are they going to stop Allende? Because his vote totals are expected to improve in 64 over 58, and this time there's no defrock priest around. This time the CIA will put $20 million into the campaign of Eduardo Frey to help him win the election. They'll focus their money on the Christian Democrats as their best bet of beating Allende and put $20 million into that effort. And indeed, Frey will finish first. So on two occasions, the CIA assisted, although we can't say for sure that it's, you know, we can never know for sure in terms of an election, that its assistance was decisive, but certainly in both elections. It put money in and certainly assisted in keeping Allende from winning office. Now, it should be pointed out, by the way, that because of the way elections developed, that there were usually at least three major candidates and therefore the vote was split, no one ever got, or rarely did anyone get 50% or more. The Chilean Constitution had long taken care of that by requiring Congress to select the president from among the top finishers. So if we have three leading candidates, it is up to Congress then to decide which of those candidates becomes president. Now this is not written into the Constitution, this part, but always, always Congress chose the top vote getter. In other words, maybe you got 38%, the next person got 36, and the next person got 35, so you're not really that far apart, but 38, that's fine. You got the most votes, so you get to be president. That was the practice and had been so through the 20th century. That is the reality, and this is how things work. Once again, 1970, another election, the division between the three segments of the political spectrum remains the same, and by God, Allende is running again. 
This time, chances seem stronger than ever that he will get elected because, in part, the Christian Democrats have lost support. The economy has not been doing well for the last three years of Frey's administration. There's a good chance that a lot of people are going to be disaffected and move further to the left. It's also very clear what Allende is going to do. I mean, he's already said that you know, he will nationalize major foreign corporations, domestic corporations, uh, rapidly accelerate land reform. People know what he's going to do. It's at this stage, in the spring of 1970, that John McCone goes to visit Richard Helms in Washington. Now, John McCone, of course, uh, was the former director of Central Intelligence. It came in after the Bay of Pigs fiasco, if you remember. But he was no longer director of Central Intelligence. He was now a member of the board of ITT, International Telephone and Telegraph, which had very large investments in the Chilean phone system. And they knew that Allende was almost certainly going to nationalize them if he got elected. So McCone went to see Richard Helms who was the current director of Central Intelligence. And he offered Helms a million dollars to help the CIA prevent Allende from getting elected. Helms had to turn the money down. CIA can't take charitable contributions. Uh, but ITT and the CIA remained in close contact in the months ahead. Uh, with the ITT advising the CIA on strategies they thought would work, etc. So there's no money that passes hand, changes hands here, but there is continuing input from ITT on what the CIA should be doing. Now, the CIA, again, will follow the same course of action that it had in the past, and that is it's going to pour money into the opposition. It's going to support both the Christian Democrats and the National Party, the Conservative Party, so the center and the right, will get support from the CIA. And this time, they had to because they really weren't sure. It wasn't clear that the Christian Democrats were that much stronger than the National Party or vice versa. So they had to sort of split their money. But they poured millions of dollars into this effort to try to prevent Allende from getting elected. So the 1970 involvement in the presidential election is nothing new. I mean, it's been going on since 58. It's just that more and more the CIA is becoming concerned that the chances for Allende seem to be getting better and better. And of course, they're right. Allende wins the largest number of votes in the September 4th, 1970 election. Now, of course, he doesn't get a majority. He's got 38%. So, really, his election still depends on Congress. President Nixon, although he's mostly preoccupied with what's going on in Vietnam, is concerned about Chile because he knows about Allende. He knows what Allende intends to do. And Many of his people see this as you know, the worst possible scenario. You know, we've got Castro in Cuba or up here, north of South America or in the Caribbean, and now down in the southern tip of South America, we'll have another, quote, communist, although Allende is really a socialist. You know, we'll have these two Marxists, one in the north, one in the south, bracketing South America. God knows how communist influence may spread from here. What Nixon decides to do is to assign a task force specifically organized to focus on Chile to try either to prevent Allende from becoming president or to get rid of him once he is president. The man who will play the central role in that task force, a man named David Atlee Phillips. Uh, David Atlee Phillips was a longtime CIA officer. He had been involved all the way back, for example, in the intervention in Guatemala. The CIA and the U.S. government in general will pursue two different strategies, some sort of a two-track approach. One is to seek a political solution to remove Allende or stop him through political methods. 
The other solution that they will pursue is to prompt a military coup. So both of these strategies will be pursued really in parallel for some time to come. One of the first steps for David Atlee Phillips after the September 4th election is to send a number of CIA officers and operatives to Chile, people who were specialists in various areas of uh, economic intervention, political operations, etc., and people who had expertise in propaganda. One of the things that the task force wants to do is to create a negative image of Allende in Chile, but also Latin America and in the United States. One of the things they do is they bring in 23 journalists at their expense to cover events in Chile after the September 4th election. Now, most of these people are not in the pay of the CIA. They're known to be fairly sympathetic, you know, uh, to the CIA, but they're not really in its pay, but a few of them are. And their job is to disseminate reports that will go through Latin America and get back to the United States as well on the negative side of all this, the, you know, the radical groups that support Allende, et cetera, the dangers uh, to the country of him becoming president, et cetera. So there is to be both a domestic and an international propaganda campaign to try to undermine uh, positive impressions of Allende. In fact, uh, the director of the CIA station in Santiago uh, later claimed in testimony that he had, in fact, uh, had a major influence on the writing of a Time magazine article. Time was featuring Allende on its cover uh, in the weeks after his election. You know, here's this Marxist who's about to become president of a Latin American country, freely elected, the implications of all of that for U.S. policy. And uh, Time did allow the CIA to review the article in advance of its being published, and they managed to convince uh, Time magazine to actually uh, incorporate more negative elements about Allende than they had in the initial draft. So there is this ongoing propaganda campaign at a number of different levels to influence public perceptions of Allende, both at home and abroad. Now, aside from this effort, the major political effort focuses on the upcoming vote in Congress. And the CIA devises a, a tactic that it refers to as the Alessandri option. Now, Jorge Alessandri was one of the other presidential candidates in 1970. He was running for the National Party. He was the Conservative Party candidate. And he had finished second in the voting. What the CIA tries to do is it tries to convince members of Congress, specifically the Christian Democrats, because they have the largest number of representatives in Congress of any single political party, you know, they are the largest single political party in the country, tries to convince members of the Christian Democratic Party specifically to join with the National Party and other conservative members of Congress and choose Alessandre, the second highest vote getter, instead of Allende. The offer to the Christian Democrats, because why should they support the National Party, their rivals too, the offer is this. You see, a president in, in Chile cannot succeed himself. In other words, you're only entitled to one six-year term of office. Then you have to leave. Frey, who many conservatives have voted for in 1964 because they figured he was a better option than Allende, Frey could not run in 1970 because he couldn't succeed himself. But if Alessandre is chosen by Congress and becomes president, he has promised that he will serve for only one day and then resign. Therefore, there will have to be a new presidential election. And in that election, Frey can run because he won't be succeeding himself. There will have been another president elected in the interim. And, of course, the conservatives, if they had to do it over again, would much rather choose Frey 
then vote for their own candidate and allow Ayanda to get back in. So that's the option that's being offered to the Christian Democrats that, okay, hold your nose, vote for Alessandre, but then within a day, new elections will be underway and Frey can get elected again. However, despite an effort, including offering some bribes along the way, Congress votes on October 24th to install Allende as president. This largely was based on two things. One, the commander of the armed forces is a man named Rene Schneider, General Rene Schneider, and we'll come back to him in a moment, uh, warned the Christian Democrats that this would not go over well. He was a constitutionalist, and this sounded, you know, it wasn't a direct violation of the Constitution, but as Schneider said, you know, it's fraught with dangers that we would violate established practice. Furthermore, the Christian Democratic representatives themselves are sensitive to what might happen, that they might set off an upheaval in Chile, because, of course, people on the left are going to say, you know, we've been, you know, playing by the rules of the game all these years, all these elections, and now suddenly when we come out on top, you change the rules, fearing the possible consequences. The Christian Democrats back away from that strategy, and most of them vote for Allende. At the same time, however, the CIA is not abandoning its other possibility. It is pursuing the other possibility of encouraging a military coup. The agent for this process was a cashiered military officer. In other words, military officer, Chilean military officer who had been thrown out of the military. He had been thrown out of the military because he would tried to overthrow the government of Eduardo Frey. And his name was Roberto Vio. Vio was a far right-wing military officer, a former officer. And Vio was the one who was going to try to engage in a plot to prompt the military to intervene and overthrow the regime and prevent Allende effectively from taking office. Vio intended to establish the impression that Allende's election was going to trigger an outburst of radical, extreme leftist actions. In other words, the country's going to come apart. We're going to have these crazy leftists outdoing things, threatening the stability of our society. The way he was going to create that impression was by kidnapping the commander of the armed forces, General Rene Schneider. Schneider was no hero to people like Vio because he was one of those constitutionalists again. He was somebody who insisted, look, if the people voted and they chose Allende, then it's Allende. Okay? And unless Allende violates the Constitution, we're not going to interfere in the political process. So Vio wanted to kidnap Schneider and make it appear that extreme leftists had kidnapped him and thereby hopefully encourage the military to intervene and seize power, convinced that they themselves indeed were being threatened by these extremists. The plan is fairly simple. The CIA is going to supply some weapons to Vio, and then he and a few compatriots will carry out the kidnapping. General Schneider, one fine morning in October, gets into his chauffeur-driven vehicle, heading for his offices in downtown Santiago. But on the way there, two vehicles cut him off. Armed men leap out of the two vehicles, 
Schneider jumps from his and pulls his service revolver. There's an exchange of gunfighter, gunfight, gunfire, and Schneider lies dead. He hasn't been kidnapped. He's been killed. Oops. Didn't intend to kill him, but when he shot at them, they felt like they should shoot back. And very quickly, it becomes apparent that this was not some leftist group. It was VO and some other extremists, right-wing extremists, who had carried out this plot. So that strategy is not going to prevent the inauguration of Allende. The CIA now focuses, and the U.S., on other tactics. One of them is economic blockade. One of the things that happens, which is reminiscent of Iran many years earlier, is that the U.S. copper companies that have been nationalized will file lawsuits against Chile in courts and markets around the world to make it difficult for Chile to sell its copper. Just as with Iranian oil back in the mid-50s, you know, who wants to buy copper in this case if it comes with a lawsuit? Uh, the lawsuit argues that, look at we were illegally nationalized. Therefore, that copper is our property, and the Chilean government doesn't have a right to sell it. In addition, the United States effectively cuts off aid to Chile, economic aid, trade credits, etc., uh, to make it very difficult for Chile to conduct its normal international commerce, because so much of it is with the United States. That's the leading market for its copper, etc. Uh, and of course, it's also the leading source of products that Chile needs to keep its economy going. For example, telephone equipment, repair parts for airliners, little things like that, parts for power generators, all come from the United States. If you can't get credit in the United States to buy that stuff, it makes it a little difficult to work the economy. So it's both private enterprise with the lawsuit on copper, but also the U.S. government cutting off trade credits and other forms of economic assistance. At this point, the CIA continues to work with the political establishment. In other words, the Christian Democrats and the National Party in particular, the center and the right political parties, that's their main focus at this stage, is to try to encourage them to block Allende's legislation, prevent him, after all, they do have a majority uh, in the legislature in both the House of Deputies and the Senate, so they should be able to block most of the things that Allende wants to do. Well, they should, except for the fact that during that little interlude back in the 1930s, when Chile had a socialist republic for a few weeks, uh, a number of laws were passed and stayed in effect that gave the president wide-ranging powers. For example, uh, Allende could carry out land reform really without any further approval from the legislature. There was already a land reform law in place. It was just that somebody had to actually carry it out, and he was doing that. Uh, the same with the readjustment, the redistribution of income, but the readjustments for inflation each year. That was already written into the legislation that existed. So what he ended up was he just tinkered with it so it worked to the benefit of the lower half of the population. So much of what Allende is doing can't really be stopped in the legislature. And the CIA, as the months drag on, becomes increasingly disenchanted with the political establishment, feeling as though they're not doing enough to stop Allende. It's at this point that the CIA station in Santiago begins turning its attention to the Gremialista movement those professional associations, some of which existed all the way back in the 19th century, but which had become particularly important since the days of the Popular Front in the 1930s. Now, the gremios, over the years, had largely been rivals competing for government resources and for legislation favorable to them. Uh, but with the growing possibility of uh, the Yende's election in 1970, the gremios had formed an umbrella association to link them nationally. And they had begun developing a coordinated policy towards the government, which was, of course, inherently hostile. So the CIA sees this opportunity. Here are people that control a vital part 
of the national economy. Much of the industry in the country, much of the transportation with the truck owners, uh, almost all of the commercial establishments in the country, etc. So here are people who have their hands on a vital part of the economy, and they, rather than these politicians, they could really do something about stopping a ending. The thing that they can do, of course, is go on strike. Now, the strategy for the strike was developed by the Gremialistas, but fully backed by the CIA, specifically backed with millions of dollars funneled in to Chile at this time and to the Gremialistas. If they are going to shut their businesses down, for weeks at a time. They're going to lose money. They want somebody to compensate them for some of their losses. The CIA will do that. They don't want to lose employees who will go off looking for other jobs if they can't work at the establishments that they normally work in. Again, we'll provide some money to keep those people at least around as workers for when the strike is over. So the CIA is going to provide the financing that will make it possible for the gremios to go on strike and stay on strike for weeks on end. Now, the intention of the gremios is to force the overthrow of the government, to paralyze the economy to the point where things start falling apart and the military will finally say, okay, enough's enough, we're going to take the guy out. The CIA fully backs that strategy. And of course, once the strike starts and economic losses mount, begins looking like, hey, this could work. But there's a fly in the ointment. And that is the Christian Democrats. Christian Democrats back the strike. But they're concerned. The gremios are a very conservative movement. Their closest political associations are with the National Party. If, in fact, this strike goes to the point where it forces a military coup, almost certainly the conservative military officers who would pull that off would favor the National Party, with the support of the gremios. And the Christian Democrats could easily find themselves out in the cold. So for the Christian Democrats, the question of, well, you know, we push this thing far enough, yeah, we'll get rid of Allende. But it doesn't mean we get back into power. We're the largest political party, but we could be on the outside looking in once again, if this goes all the way. So there is discussion within the Christian Democratic Party about an exit strategy. You know, how can we resolve this week in the end day, but not find ourselves with a nationalist party government imposed by the military? Now, the CIA isn't sure what's going on within the Christian Democratic Party, but they want to find out. And they have an access. The chief education officer at the U.S. Embassy in Santiago is a CIA officer. He had worked previously in assisting the military in the overthrow of the government in Brazil in 1964. In fact, he had stepped out of covert operations, but was specifically brought back in. He was one of the specialists who was brought back in uh, to deal with the situation in Chile. He is responsible for passing out assistance to students in Chile. Sounds like a fairly innocuous kind of activity, unless you're a student, of course. He passes out things like Fulbright scholarships for university students that allow them to go to the United States. Now, again, so what? Well, in Chile, as in most third world countries, student politics is extremely important. 
This isn't just, oh, you know, who gets elected to student government this year. National political parties have youth divisions of those parties at universities. And the people who move up the ranks in those university political units are the future leaders of those national parties. Furthermore, these students provide the cannon fodder uh, for political demonstrations, for clashes with the police, or clashes with opposing political groups, etc. So these student political leaders have a direct link into the highest echelons of the national political parties. The head of the Christian Democratic student movement at the National University was one such individual. And he'd been promised a trip to the United States, including a visit to Disneyland. He was told by the CIA officer to get information on what was going on within the Christian Democratic Party about the strike, or he didn't get to go to Disneyland. This is a true story. Hmm? Uh, he got the information, and he provided a detailed account of the thinking within the Christian Democrats so that the CIA could adjust its policy accordingly. In other words, they didn't want to be sitting there pushing the pot of the strike for the last instant, only to find the Christian Democrats pulling the rug out from under them. They did try to convince the Christian Democrats to continue, but when it was clear that where the thinking was going, the CIA adjusted and starts to push for the strategy the Christian Democrats want, which is, of course, for the Christian Democrats to form this electoral alliance with the National Party to present the government with this alternative that will end the strike, but only if the military is brought in, Pratt is put in as Minister of the Interior, and then we hold the March elections, and then we get to throw you out. That strategy grew out of these events, of the Christian Democrats not wanting to see the military take over and find themselves on the outside looking in once again. Now, of course, as we've seen, that's a strategy works up to a point, the compromise is accepted by the government, the elections are held, but in the end, the opposition makes no headway. They really have no more power in Congress than they had before the March elections. Now, the strategy is to create as much disruption as possible, because from here on forward, the CIA no longer believes that a political strategy is going to work. The only tactic after the March elections is to push and push until the military will intervene. This is when assassinations occur, and this is when sabotage begins. Groups start blowing up power pylons, knocking out the national electrical system, etc. At first, these groups weren't very effective. The first one that tried this, you know, the people that did it blew themselves up rather than the power pylon. But the CIA had brought in people with paramilitary skills to train uh, groups in Chile to carry out these tactics. So the idea was to, again, push the military to say, look, the country is coming apart. We can't control the situation. People are sabotaging oil supplies. They're blowing up the national power network. And it's all because we have this Marxist president. So you must do something. You must end this crisis by intervening. And indeed, newspapers in the country were openly calling for military intervention. They were saying, well, they didn't say, we want you to overthrow the government. They would write editorials, such as one that said, well, you know, it is the constitutional obligation of the military to intervene if the government has violated the Constitution, and then they cited examples of what they claim were violations of the Constitution, and leaving it for the reader to figure out, well, obviously the military must intervene. Uh, most of these newspapers uh, were, of course, receiving funding from the CIA to assist them uh, in carrying out this strategy. And indeed, a number of radio stations in the country were also uh, part of the process. And also part of the process was not just political opinion, uh, but spreading rumors. For example, one newspaper, uh, which was being subsidized by the CIA, published a story that the country was running out of insulin for diabetics. So that within a few weeks, all of the diabetics in Chile would be dead. 
because there, there wouldn't be any insulin left. And, so, and of course, what actually happened was that people then rushed to the pharmacies to get insulin, fearing that it would run out. And of course, they immediately created a scarcity, just like if you, know, if you tell people, well, the price of gasoline is going up to $5 a gallon tomorrow, everyone will rush to the gas station. By tomorrow, there won't be any gas in any gas station. These kinds of strategies, again, too crude, great for the military, the conviction that, look, if the country's falling apart, you must act, and you must act now. The biggest obstacle in getting the military to act remained Carlos Prats. His actions in the attempted coup in June of 1973 proved beyond the shadow of a doubt that he was going to support this government in terms of being a constitutionally elected government, no matter what. And as long as he was in charge, it was going to be very difficult to get the plotters working with Pinochet, whom the CIA was well aware of and in contact with. They weren't telling them what to do, but they were aware of what they were plotting to do. But it was going to be very difficult to get Pinochet to act if he had to violate the orders of his own commander. You know, that would be a basic violation of his responsibilities as a military officer. And of course, there were a number of other officers who were constitutionalists and some who were actually pro-government. So Pinochet would find himself in a very difficult situation if the commander of the armed forces is insisting that the military will not act against the regime. At this point, as pressure is growing on Pratt's, he one morning gets into his chauffeur-driven car heading towards that same office that Schneider once occupied and finds himself being cut off by a vehicle. <laughs> Having a fairly good memory of the fate of his predecessor, he leaps out of his vehicle with his service revolver drawn, rushes over to the other vehicle to find himself staring at a middle-aged woman and her teenage son. Out of the park next to where this incident occurs come a group of reporters from local opposition radio stations and newspapers to take pictures of this incident and report, you know, as they put in the headlines, Prats is loco, you know, Prats is crazy. You know, this is a madman who's the commander in chief of the armed forces. Here he is aiming his gun at this middle-aged woman and her teenage son. It was, of course, another setup uh, to undermine his image and help push him finally to the point where he resigned as commander of the armed forces. Now, this, of course, rapidly accelerates and facilitates the planning for the coup. The U.S. is going to provide another assistance. Part of the coup plan is for the Chilean Navy to occupy the port of Valparaiso, the principal port of the country, and also several other key ports along the coast. But they want to be able to do this in as surreptitious a manner as possible. And of course, it's hard to you know, hide the Navy someplace for a couple of days. But the Yende government has, of course, tried to maintain a very positive relationship with the military including allowing them to continue their long-time relationship with the U.S. military. And the Chilean Navy has scheduled joint maneuvers with units of the U.S. Navy off the coast of Chile for the early part of September. Those maneuvers are being carried out with one variation. On September 10th, the signals and communications between the Chilean <laughs> and U.S. Navy vessels indicate that operations are continuing as planned. In fact, the Chilean Navy has left the site of the maneuvers and is steaming rapidly towards the Chilean coast to occupy those ports. But the U.S. Navy is helping maintain the fiction that they are still far out at sea, assisting the plotters in one of the steps they need to take. 
when the seizure of power takes place on September 11th, on that day, 320 people are summarily executed by the military. In other words, these were people that were political figures, labor leaders, and others. Uh, the military had a list, partly, mostly put together by the military, partly with some assistance from the U.S., from the CIA. Uh, and they simply went and shot these people. They'd find them at home or wherever. they just kill them uh, to get rid of them immediately. You know, this was before they also began making thousands of other people disappear. They also killed uh, two American citizens, Charles Horman and Frank Teruji. Uh, both of these were young men who had been uh, involved in leftist causes in Chile, in Santiago, the capital. Um, with Horman, there may have been a suspicion, because he had been on the coast uh, just before the coup, uh, that he had become aware of cooperation between the U.S. military and the Chilean military in the coup, and that he was executed for that reason. In any case, the U.S. Embassy denied any knowledge. Um, his story was uh, widely publicized eventually in the book and movie called Missing. Uh, and now, many years later, his widow has managed to get evidence that, in fact, the U.S. Embassy pretty well knew what had happened to him. But, of course, they hardly wanted to admit that. Pinochet's new regime also established a national security agency called DINA. And this organization was responsible for carrying out assassinations against resistance leaders or political opponents uh, who had left the country. You know, among them was Carlos Prats, the general who had, after the coup, gone into exile in Buenos Aires. He and his wife were blown up in their car. And Orlando Letelier, who was the former, US, uh, former Chilean ambassador to the United States and then Chilean foreign minister, uh, he had been arrested uh, put in a prison camp, then finally released because of international pressures. Uh, he was killed with a bomb uh, in his car uh, while driving on Connecticut Avenue near DuPont Circle in Washington, D.C. That assassination was carried out uh, by a group of people, including an American expatriate living in Chile, and also uh, several uh, Cubans who had been part of the Bay of Pigs intervention. Uh, so in any case, the security forces of the Pinochet regime reached far and wide uh, after the coup to prevent the development of an opposition that would challenge his regime. Now, in the aftermath, in the years that followed uh, the overthrow of Allende, the new Chilean government under Pinochet set a very different economic course. Uh, they obviously moved away from the socialist strategy, but they also uh, abandoned the import substituting industrialization ideas of uh, several decades. They wanted to open the economy up completely to the international economy, abandon the idea of industrialization, and go back to the idea of exporting primary products like copper, uh, things like fish meal, uh, grapes, fruit, you name it. Much of this strategy was plotted by the uh, American economist uh, Milton Friedman and uh, was actually put into place by a number of his students who were trained at the University of Chicago. In fact, in Chile, they were known as the Chicago Boys. The land reform that Allende had initiated was completely reversed because, of course, it was seen as violating private property. The economy was opened up as import duties were lowered and Foreign investment was welcomed back. Uh, the one thing that even Pinochet would not do is give back the copper mines to the U.S. companies. But he compensated them uh, with $350 million uh, and allowed them to reinvest that money in new mining enterprises in the country, along with encouraging widespread foreign investment in general. Chile's economy, indeed, boomed in the years after 1975, after a period of adjustment and recovery, in no small measure because the government kept wages at a fraction of what they had been 
before the coup in 1973. In fact, it went to the point of declaring uh, the act of being poor as illegal. You could be arrested uh, for begging for money on the street as a subversive act. Mm -hmm. You were trying to make the government look bad. Maintaining that very low level of wages, of course, provided a very attractive uh, magnet for foreign investors into Chile in the 1970s and into the 1980s. However, along the way, with a largely unregulated economy, an enormous amount of, uh, let's say, financial finagling went on. Uh, not unlike the kinds of things we saw in this country a few years ago, uh, but to an even greater or more extreme degree. And as a result, in the mid-1980s, uh, Chile's economy uh, suffered a severe collapse as a result, as uh, many of these corporations uh, simply went under, including many owned by Pinochet's son, uh, because they were largely fraudulent and had gone uninvestigated and unregulated over the years. Although the regime had outlawed political parties and had attempted to run the country essentially by itself and banned uh, union activities, peasant organizations, etc., uh, pressure mounted, particularly once the financial crisis had struck, pressure mounted for a return to electoral politics. Finally, in 1988, Pinochet agreed to hold a referendum to determine the future of the country. Basically, people were given uh, a yes or no question. Yes, I want President Pinochet to stay as president forever, uh, or no, I don't. <laughs> Uh, with most of the media outlets under the control of the government and a substantial amount of money at its disposal, and with the assistance of a public relations firm from New York, uh, the government felt fairly confident that they would win this vote. But, in fact, they lost. <laughs> Majority of Chileans voted to get rid of the regime. And now the dictatorship had to provide for the beginning of electoral politics once again. And in 1990, a presidential election was held. A man named Patricio Aylwin was elected president. He was a Christian Democrat. So the electoral process swung over uh, to the center once more. Not surprisingly, this had been the largest single political party in the country. Uh, and beyond that, the fact is that although there were elections once again. They were not entirely free and open. Not everyone was going to be allowed to vote. And more importantly, the military was given a major role in the government, no matter how the elections did turn out. In 1993, another election took place. And this time, a man named Eduardo Frey was elected president. This was not the same Eduardo Frey that was president from 1964 to 1970. This was his son. Uh, the elder Frey had passed away. And then, finally, in 1999, another presidential election uh, bringing Ricardo Lagos to power, a socialist. And so for the first time since 1973, really more than a quarter of a century, a socialist had once again been elected president of Chile, although he was going to follow a far more moderate course than Allende. As for General Pinochet, he had stepped back, although he retained enormous influence within the military. Uh, there have been attempts both internationally and domestically to put him on trial uh, for the disappearance of thousands of Chileans, but up to now those efforts have failed. Chilean courts have determined that he's uh, too ill uh, to be put on trial. Looking at the intervention, as we always do in terms of, okay, why did it succeed? in this case, or why did it fail, and others. Going over these factors, political participation. This was certainly a factor that you'd have to say worked against the CIA, because political participation was widespread and growing in Chile. 
The fact is more and more people have been incorporated, and by 1970, even most peasants, in fact, uh, for the congressional election in 1973, even illiterates were going to be allowed to vote, and illiterates had been banned from voting in the past. So there was widespread political participation, and clearly people were deeply involved in the political process. Political support. Here, it's kind of a toss-up. And the government can probably claim no more than half of the population in terms of support. And the opposition pretty much the same. It's pretty much divided the country down the middle. Although, I mean, as we know in this country, presidents get elected with left than 50% of the vote and still manage to finish their term of office. Um, as far as coherence of the state, again, this is a bit complex. In most cases, we can say, look, like in Cuba, there's no division within the state. It's perfectly coherent. Or uh, in a case like Guatemala or Iran, right from the beginning, we know that there's a deep division. In both cases, the military not being very loyal uh, to the administration. Here, the picture isn't that simple. Because in fact, if we look at General Schneider and then General Pratt, both of these men were representative of the constitutionalist tradition in the military and were going to fully support the government as long as it didn't violate the Constitution. Only over time does that support deteriorate as conditions grow worse and as finally, well, first Schneider and then Pratt's are essentially eliminated from the military, opening up other possibilities. So at least initially it weighs in favor of the regime. Over time, that factor will come to weigh against the regime's survival. Economic conditions, uh, these certainly have an impact. Initially, they're very positive because, of course, land reform, redistribution of wealth, expansion of education, expansion of health services, all appeal to the half of the population, the lower half of the population, that is particularly the group that the government seeks support from. Over time, however, the economy with the American economic blockade and other problems uh, faced deterioration. Inflation became not just a problem, but an acute problem, reaching triple-digit levels by the last year of the Allende government. So here again, we have a positive beginning, but by the time of the coup in 73, the economy has definitely taken a downturn. As far as openness, although this is a long-established government, the fact is that the CIA was able to operate with relative impunity within Chile itself. Part of this, of course, because they had the cover of the U.S. Embassy. But beyond that, Allende was hesitant uh, to crack down on what he knew were activities by the CIA because he was already under such heavy criticism from the opposition. Uh, who were claiming that he was violating basic democratic rights, uh, that he did not want uh, to exacerbate that problem. And so, too, with the military's ties to the U.S., he didn't want to alienate the military by forcing them to break those ties. So we have a state that has established apparatus, but they cannot function very effectively in this case, and indeed the CIA is able to operate with relative impunity. As far as the plan, um, it gets, let's say, somewhere around to C. Um, certainly the initial strategies, trying to prevent the end of election, prevent his selection from, by Congress, uh, relying on the established political parties, that process clearly proves to be ineffective and finally is abandoned after the failures of the congressional election strategy in March of 73. On the other hand, over time, the strategy of pushing a coup and working with the Gremialistas and others uh, to push the military to the point where it will finally act, that strategy proves successful. So there are two tracks. One proves to be a dead end. The other one finally proves to be successful. As far as the U.S. domestic conditions go, Again, this activity, which really begins in 1970, although it is a, at the time of the Vietnam War, is not directly affected by the consequences of the war. In other words, the Cold War consensus has not yet collapsed. The CIA does not face intense investigation by uh, 
Congress, questioning of the president and his foreign policy activities, at least when it comes to events in places like Chile. But of course, that is about to change. In fact, Chile will become one of the uh, key cases investigated by Congress as a result of the Watergate scandal and in the, investiga the subsequent investigation into the CIA. But at this point, at least, they're relatively unencumbered in carrying out their strategy. If we're going to summarize all of this, the best way to do it is the following. In terms of, okay, why did this succeed? These factors seem, well, you know, uh, political participation and political support seem pretty good. The economy starts off good, but then it goes bad. Uh, the same with state coherence. The simple answer is this. Chile was going to be a difficult nut to crack for the CIA. It had a long history of constitutional government. It had a set of political parties that had worked together fairly effectively over the years and tended to resolve their problems peacefully. There were high levels of political participation. The country was divided, but the government did enjoy support from a substantial part of the population, perhaps half. So this was not an easy case. This was not the Congo where you don't have established institutions. This is not a situation where the military right from the outset, or most of the military from the outset, is opposed to the government. Those factors weighing in favor of the regime help explain why the CIA had to go to such lengths over almost four years to oust this regime. Why it had to take so many different measures, from economic blockade to propaganda, uh, to support of established political parties, to paramilitary actions involving sabotage, etc. Why such an elaborate array of strategies and tactics had to be employed was precisely because this was such a challenge. Ultimately, the regime was vulnerable. Ultimately, there were elements of the military that had long been committed to its overthrow. Half of the population was opposed to the administration. The economy does get worse over time. So there is vulnerability. And ultimately, by carrying out a long-term, very costly and very elaborate strategy, the CIA is able to topple a regime that had, at least for a time, a number of factors weighing in favor of its survival. So if we summarize all of this, go to the last slide as we always look at the historical crisis. And the basic crisis, of course, was over time, Chilean society had tried to open up to incorporate more of its citizens into access to resources and political power. But the final step of bringing in almost half the population, the peasant population, to full citizenship politically and economically, which was starting to take place under Allende, and providing greater benefits to the urban poor as well, that finally broke the system and deeply divided the country. For US motivations, there's certainly a billion dollars in US investment that was a major motivation. But on the larger scale, and here we get back to this issue of the US sort of grand plan, Chile was to be a showcase. In some ways, like Vietnam, but with a better start, you know, where we're going to build a nation from scratch in Vietnam, in Chile, we seem to have many of the pieces there, a long functioning political system, a high degree of political stability, a significant degree of economic development, although major problems remain, here was a place the US could fashion a model showing that its version of the future, of capitalist development, liberal democracy, uh, maintaining political order, avoiding radical change, that that model could work. Allende's election, after expending hundreds of millions of dollars to try to make that model work under Frey, Allende's election threatened to undermine the feasibility of that project, to make it seem as if, okay, Chileans have been shown the American model, they've had a demonstration of it for six years under Frey, and you know what? They don't want it. They chose the socialist. So beyond protecting a billion dollars, there was the larger strategy of, look at, we need to be able to show the world that we 
can reshape it in our image and do that successfully. Allende was a threat to that, and ultimately that became a prime motivation for his overthrow. As far as tactics, they focus mostly on the political and the economic. Economic blockade, economic sabotage, political supporting the conventional political parties, creating disruptions, but it also veers towards paramilitary activities, particularly after the failed March elections. But we've got, again, traditional activities as well in terms of propaganda. So a wider range, mostly focused on things like economic blockade, uh, support of political opponents, and, of course, propaganda. The ultimate strategy that works, of course, is to use as much of this as possible to destabilize the society and convince the military or those who still doubt in the military that they must act to prevent social collapse. The outcome is a success in the end, but only after the expenditure of tens of millions of dollars and the pursuit of a variety of tactics over an extended period of time, because indeed the regime had certain elements to it, characteristics that weighed in its favor. The CIA would have to go to great lengths to overcome those obstacles and finally succeed in pushing the military towards intervention in September of 1973. Next time, we'll take on another case in Latin America, this time in Nicaragua, and see a vast paramilitary strategy uh, resembling that of the one in Cuba.